Look, I am not stupid, you know. They cannot make things like that yet. Not yet. Not for about 40 years. This motion picture contains scenes of strong physical force. Parental discretion is advised. Network television premiere. The Terminator is not a man to be reasoned with. Why does it want me? The Terminator is not a man to be bargained with. Can you stop it? The Terminator is not a man. In the box office blockbuster, Arnold Schwarzenegger is the Terminator. I'll be back next. Jim Cameron was a stoner, high school janitor turned truck driver until he saw Star Wars in 1977. He studied everything he could find on film technology at USC Library, and then with the help of a bunch of dentist investors, filmed his first short film, Xenogenesis, in 1978. The following year, he began working for Roger Corman Studios, standing out for his innovations as art director on Battle Beyond the Stars. Perhaps most infamously, he put together high-tech hallways in spaceships based on the styrofoam containers found at McDonald's, who went on to work on films like Escape from New York, Galaxy of Terror, and Android. He aspired to write and direct, and was finally given his opportunity by producer Ovidio Asonitis. Asonitis had a pretty bad reputation when it came to handling directors, and he and Cameron did not get along on the set of Piranha 2 Spawning. Cameron was fired repeatedly, and ultimately was not allowed to finish the film, but he was kept on to the production in a technical capacity, so he got to watch his movie be bastardized, and it failed at the box office. Plus, it did not help Cameron's reputation. During his last days in Rome, Cameron missed the debut of the film because he was sick, he was suffering from fever dreams. One of those dreams was a vision of a skeletal robot, and the image impressed him so much that he woke up out of his delirium and sketched out the robot so that he wouldn't forget it. Beyond the reputational and creative harm done to him on Piranha 2, his salary had also been cut down because of his demotion. And by the time he got back to Los Angeles, he was essentially penniless. He was sleeping on a friend's floor, and he knew that if he wanted to do anything in the industry again, especially beyond a technical level, he was gonna to need to create something that was undeniable. Along with the vision from his fever dream, he also took inspiration from John Carpenter's Halloween. In fact, he was such a strong inspiration that one of the earliest and most notable images of the Terminator created by Cameron featured him crawling with a butcher knife in its hand. And he envisioned that robot being a relentless pursuer rather than supernatural means allowing this creature to be this unstoppable force of death and destruction. It was going to be scientifically based. It's a robot. It's from the future. It's a technology that's so far beyond our own that we just don't have the materials or the know-how to make this thing stop killing people. In this city, under cover of darkness, someone is stalking Sarah Connor. Sarah Connor? Yes. Sarah Connor, 35, brutally shot to death in her home. You're dead, honey. What's this? Dead girl, too. Sarah Louise Connor. Is this right? Of course, we'll have more on this late breaking story as it comes in. She doesn't know why, but it's her he's after. Did you reach the next girl yet? No, I keep getting an answer machine. Check up if you're there. I'm really scared. I think that there's somebody after me. And no one can help her. Except for one man. I'm Reese. It's a sign to protect you. You've been targeted for termination. <laughs> It's not a man, a machine. It's a Terminator. Underneath, it's a hyperalloy combat chassis. Microprocessor controlled, fully armored, very tough. But outside, it's living human tissue. They cannot make things like that yet. Not yet. 
not for about 40 years. Are you saying it's from the future? They came to fight. For the one woman who could save their future. And this uh, computer thinks it can win by uh, killing the mother of its enemy. One came to protect her. I came across time for you, Sarah. The other to kill her. Arnold Schwarzenegger is the Terminator. Inhuman. Relentless. Unstoppable. He has only one purpose. Murder. Can you stop it? I don't know. And now Sarah Connor's world has become a battlefield. With her at ground zero. And the Terminator closing in. An adventure unlike anything you've ever seen before. Arnold Schwarzenegger is the Terminator. In the improbable case that a person listening to a Terminator podcast isn't familiar with the Terminator, briefly, a computerized Cold War defense system called Skynet had gained some sense of sentience and determined that the only way to stop aggression between humans is to end the human race, that they were just an inherent threat, and so began systematically terminating the human population. Humanity, of course, fought against this, but were very near the brink of extinction before one military leader of genius named John Connor rose up and was able to command the surviving human forces to take down Skynet. Right before Skynet is going to be completely defeated, they use new time travel technology to send a killer robot. Not a robot. Cyborg. Cybernetic organism. The Terminator's an infiltration unit. Part man, part machine. Underneath it's a hyperalloy combat chassis. Microprocessor controlled. Fully armored. Very tough. But outside it's living human tissue. Flesh, skin, hair blood grown for the cyborgs. From the future, back to the year 1984, with the intention of assassinating the mother of John Connor, Sarah Connor, before she conceives John, and therefore stopping the human resistance before it ever starts. Aware of this plan, John Connor sends one of his trusted soldiers, Cal Reese, in pursuit of the Terminator in 1984. I'm here to help you. I'm Reese, Sergeant Techcom, BN 38416, assigned to protect you. You've been targeted for termination. With the one advantage that Reese actually has memorized the picture of the Sarah Connor that he's looking for and is able to locate her more quickly where the Skynet system and the Terminator only have the name and they're essentially going through the phone book. And again, if we're dealing with a younger crowd, a phone book was a giant catalog printed on paper, yellow pages, that featured people's names and phone numbers, and it was the way people found one another before Google existed. And so you'd have a list of women named Sarah Connor. This robot goes around killing every woman named Sarah Connor until he finally finds the correct one, the future mother of John Connor, who is saved by Kyle Reese. Then the pair of them flee the Terminator over an extended period of time until they're able to finally confront and destroy the device. Prior to this though, Kyle Reese conceived John Connor with Sarah Connor before perishing, leaving Sarah Connor as a single mother to raise this messianic figure. Tape seven, November 10. Where was I? What's most difficult for me is trying to decide what to tell you and what not to. But I guess I have a while yet before you're old enough to even understand these tapes. They're more for me at this point, just so that I can get it straight. Should I tell you about your father? Boy, that's a tough one. Will it affect your decision to send him here, knowing that he is your father? If you don't send Kyle, you can never be. God, a person could go crazy thinking about this. I suppose I will tell you. I owe him that. Maybe it'll help if you know that in the few hours that we had together, we loved a lifetime's worth. 
Cameron had entered into a creative and romantic relationship with noted producer Gail Ann Hurd. And once he had a finished script, they began trying to shop it around in studios. Nobody was interested. Everybody saw this as a B movie. Nobody wanted to take a chance on it. Ultimately, a small British film company called Himdell Pictures expressed an interest. My name's Mud. Mel Mud. 2D. I'm a uh, comic book detective. Now comics. Yeah, you might say I know a little bit about them. In fact, I know a lot about them. Hey, hey, man, where you going with Tony? What kind of stuff is oh, this? Here? Sorry, <laughs> see, I forgot. I, I forgot I, nothing, I man. My mind, I mean. How can you slip your mind? I'm the best thing that ever happened to this company. Man, let me tell you what's happening, people. You know who I am. I'm Mr. T. You see me over Rocky 3 to AT&T, TNT, known all over the world. So the best thing that ever happened to me, I've been teamed up with Now Comics. You know what this slogan is? Now is better than ever. And I pity the poor competition. All the other comic books, get out of here. I'm with Now. So that's what it's going to be. Don't forget it. Huh. That's right, Mr. T. We join forces to create an exciting, action-packed comic book series using some of the best talent in the industry. And who better to star in that comic book series than the internationally recognized real-life superhero, Mr. T. You better believe it. And I'm so happy to be a part of this company. I just can't wait to get out there in the world, tell the kids, tell the grown-ups, tell everybody what's happening here. And like I said before, I pity the competition. They ain't got a chance. This is a Batman, Robin character, this Superman, they ain't real. I'm the only real man around. So you better buy. <sighs> Croquel Comics launched around October 1985 with Eben, E-B-N-N, number one, per its indicia. Quoting from AtomicAvenue.com, Eben the Raven was found wandering in the desert wasteland with no food or water by his friend Jack the Rabbit. Recovering from his dehydrating trauma, Eben decides to dress like the men with no name and become a bounty hunter. With nothing but his six-gun, his wits, and a foot-long beak, Eben tracks and captures criminals who flee from the long arm of the law. With a western tableau out of a Sergio Leone film and no humans in sight, Eben takes on such villains as Dr. Leo Phylum and Dirty Dingo Dog, the meanest hombre this side of Doggy Daddy. This is pure anthropomorphic western, distinguished by sparse but effective animal artwork. The credited co-creators were writer Mike Dimpsey, penciler letterer Chris Ecker, and inker Mike Schneider. While solidly illustrated in the funny animal style, Eben was rather violent, featuring copious blood and a graphic decapitation. It was more a neo-western-like escape from New York, with an urban setting, automobiles, and plenty of 80s clothing. However, it was married to fantasy trappings, with Eben wielding a sword against robed cultists and the like. The first issue features a list of distributors carrying the small press title, along with their full addresses. Included were Wisconsin's Capital City Distributors, Illinois' Glenwood Distribution, California California's Bud Plant Incorporated, Maryland's Diamond Comic Distributors Inc., Oregon's Second Genesis, New York's Comics Unlimited, and Kansas Kafko Inc. Honestly, I was still almost entirely dependent on newsstand distribution for my comics at this point, and I have no conscious awareness of over half this list from my own days in retail. It's been years since I thought about Bud Plant, who's still kicking around with a small mail order business. Before he sold his distribution network to Diamond in 1988, Bud Plant was the dominant supplier to the direct market on the West Coast. In Chuck Rosansky's article Advantages of Scale from the Mile High Comics website, he recounts how pioneer direct market distributor Phil Su Ling lost his initial monopoly through Seagate distribution to an antitrust suit levied by competitor New Media Distribution Urjax. Su Ling tried to retain his edge by opening a warehouse in Sparta, Illinois, where most North American comics were printed. Sulling could collect his orders direct from Sparta and airmail his shipments across the nation. There were apparently a total of 19 direct market distributors buying from Marvel Comics in 1979. And to level the playing field for the other 18, Marvel instituted a freight rebate system in 1982 that helped with the profitability of trucking shipments over airmailing them but squeezed out smaller regional operations. The shipping wars had caused the closure of Rosansky's own wife's network, Alternate Realities Distributing, Inc., which had serviced Colorado and a number of international accounts. A further strain was placed by DC Comics, as Rosansky related how Marvel editor-in-chief Jim Shooter had been an open and honest dealer with the direct market. While DC's Paul Levitz was a corporate suit who used the distributors as pawns in his war with Marvel for market share. Essentially, DC chose to cherry-pick from the 19 existing distributors that were dealing with Marvel, effectively killing the distributors who were not chosen, including alternate realities. By dealing with only the largest distributors, DC ensured a steadier stream of payment, with fewer concession made than Marvel. 
By Rosansky's estimation though, it also slowed the growth of comic shops dependent on more flexible local distributors offering personalized service. However, the eventual war between Diamond and Capital led to their offering service to any Mayfly operation that could clear a monthly $300 check, creating a glut of over 4,000 new retailers between 1988 to 1993, the boom and bust years. However, we're getting ahead of ourselves. One of the largest distributors was Pacific Comics, who themselves put out a color line of comics by the likes of Neil Adams, but collapsed by the mid-1980s. Croquel's Eben was part of the black and white boom of the mid-80s, fueled by the dramatic rags-to-riches success of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It was vastly more economical for amateurs to produce black and white comics with a smaller print run than Pacific's attempt to compete with DC and Marvel on their own terms with expensive, established talent. However, it also meant every fly-by-night nobody was coming up with overlong titles involving anthropomorphic critters in humorous or violent scenarios. Ed Ben the Raven being a prime example of a Cerebus wannabe cribbing from Stephen King's Gunslinger instead of Barry Smith's Conan. Eben No. 2 was announced for a January 1986 release, but was dated within as February. It offered a backup feature called Silverwing about a, quote, hard-boiled dinosaur detective, drawn by one Mark A. Nelson of future Dark Horse Aliens fame. Eben No. 3 had a June cover date, quite the delay, and was now published by, er, Now Comics. The inside front cover offered, the story so far. There was also a house ad for Now Comics, advertising the title Siphons, Ralph Snart Adventures, Eben, and Vector while announcing, Now is the time. Excerpt from the summer 1986, cover dated Amazing Heroes Preview Special No. 3. Vector, written, illustrated, and programmed by Jim McGreal, co-created by Rich Mrozek. 32 full-color pages on white paper, $1.50. Direct sales distribution, published bi-monthly by Now Comics. The end of June will see the debut of what Now Comics publisher Tony Caputo describes as the ultimate computer-enhanced comic. Vector will show what computers can do in comics and enhance the storytelling instead of overpowering it. All that Caputo could say about the story is that it's hard to describe, but it's definitely a story that you can put yourself into. And again, the computer-enhanced images will complement the artwork instead of being the full art package. Artist Jim McGreal, working with an ATT frame creation system, a computer with a list price of about $40,000, and a Diablo jet printer, which will present a product which is far beyond what was done on Shatter. Hoping to lure people into comics who don't necessarily already read comics, they hope to distribute the book in computer shops as well as the direct comic shops. It would definitely be something to sell next to a home computer, Caputo said, and to get people interested who are purely computer buffs without interest in comics. Excerpt from the April 1st, 1986, cover dated Amazing Heroes number 92, News Flashes. Now Comics' Ralph Snarf has been changed to Ralph Snart upon request from Dennis Kitchen, whose underground Snarf Narf is still available in many stores. Now's title is still scheduled for May 31st release at the low cover price of $1. Back to the inside front cover, writer-editor Mike Dimpsey offered a rundown of the Now offerings. Ralph Snart Adventures No. 1 was out that same month, spinning out of a fanzine anthology into professional, if small press, publishing. The following month, Evan bowed out, leaving Ralph Snart to greet the debut issues of the color series Siphons and computer-generated Vector. Excerpt from Comics in Review by Chris Mayer from the October 1st, 1986 cover dated Amazing Heroes number 104. Vector number one, written by Jim McGreal and Richard Mrozek, Now Comics $1.50. Vector number one is one of several strong entries from Now Comics. Vector boasts computer graphics, but don't assume it's a ripoff of Shatter, because it isn't. Vector begins with a seemingly innocent home computer, a birthday gift from Alice to to husband Henry to help his writing. The computer has a logic of its own, however, not to mention an apparent onboard power supply and a faulty off switch. It's magic, basically, and soon endows Henry with the ability to foresee the future in computer color graphics. Shatter's draw was the drawing, with all the line work developed on computer. The technique, at best, was merely interesting for a first effort. In Vector, admittedly a simpler and more innocent comic, the computer technique is at least integral to the story, with full color graphics appearing only when the Vector power manifests itself. The rest of the artwork is simple simple but clean cartoony style, akin to, if less polished, than Boyer's Masked Man. Better complementing the computer art than would a more commercial style. Not terribly deep, the story does have fun and mystery and hints of the vector power potential, all of which I hope will be developed. Humorous touches keep the story light. The lead characters are properly surprised by the exotic events intruding on their lives, but display a minimum of naivete. Cheap shot ignorance, actually, which so often affects horror and sci-fi victims. The ending is a weak cliffhanger, but the potential is here nonetheless for more continuing fun, and you do get 
27 full color pages for your buck 50. Only the final issues of the initial three issue run of Ralph Snart came out the month after. Excerpt from the summer 1986 cover dated Amazing Heroes Preview Special number three. Graphic albums. Now comics. The new major independent on the scene has announced plans to start on a quarterly basis the publication of a series of graphic novels in the Dark Knight format of square bound comic book format volumes. Most of the books will be one shots, but some two volume sets will also be produced. The first entry in the now library will be Michael Eben Dempsey and Mark Clone Zone Nelson's Silverwing in late summer. The Funny Animal Detective series, parts of which already ran in Eben number two and three, will be published in black and white. The book doesn't need to be in color, commented publisher Tony Caputo. Mark's use of tones makes the project incredible in black and white. As for the story, he describes it as quite strange, but intriguing and fun. The 64 page graphic novel will sell for the remarkably low price of $2.95. This will be followed by Mirror Walker. Written and drawn by Barry Peterson and Eric Shrimp, Mirror Walker boasts a radical concept. The background for each panel consists of a full color photograph. Photographer Eric Shrimp, winner of a photography award from Omni Magazine, uses real locales for the background, as well as creating the illusion of a forced perspective by changing the distance and angles used in the backgrounds. The artwork itself will be painted on acetate overlays, and when added to the backgrounds, give the impression of an animation cell instead of just a two-dimensional drawn picture. Publisher Tony Caputo explained that the look of the finished product takes on an old Walt Disney type style with suggestion of the Japanese animation of today. And there is a tremendous amount of depth per panel because of the manner in which art overlays and photo backgrounds have been carefully choreographed. The actual details concerning the story are fairly closely guarded, but the implications seem to be that the book will involve an evil sorcerer of some type and magic will be flying throughout. The third volume in the Now Library series will probably be The Silencer, a horrific story Story of a real life vigilante, not the kind you would see running around in a neon red, white, and blue costume. This one, written by Blair Kramer, will carry a mature reader's advisory. Excerpt from the Winter 1987 cover dated Amazing Heroes Preview Special number four. Again in the graphic albums section, Now Comics. The Now Library will consist of quarterly comic book sized square bound graphic novels of 48 to 64 pages. Yep, you guessed it, the Dark Knight format. As announced last preview special, Silverwing will be the Now Library's first release. Aloysius Silverwing is a Saurian gumshoe whose tales hover in the gray area between serious mystery and parody of hard-boiled detective fiction. His adventures take place in the same universe as Mike Dempsey's Eben, where Silverwing appeared in a backup tale in issues two through three. The book, a 64-page black and white by Dempsey and Mark Clonezo Nelson, will retail for $2.95. Mirror Walker, as reported in past preview specials, is about a character called Alan Nonsense, who walks through certain mirrors which function as portals in time and space. The background for each panel consists of a full-color photograph by Eric Shrimp, and the artwork itself will be painted on as State overlays by artist Barry Peterson. Mirror Walker is written by Stefan Rutzmacher. Eben number four and the second issues of Siphons and Vector arrived in August of 1986. The inside front cover promoted Now Comics presence at the 1986 Chicago Con and a shift in Eben's schedule to bi monthly publishing. After a one page teaser, Dimpsey and Grass Green's backup, Combat Wombat and his Howlin' Critters, took over from Silverwing, which moved to a graphic novel. Excerpt from Comics in Review by Gerard Jones from the February 1st, 1986 cover dated Amazing Heroes number 110. Eben number 4, written by Mike Dempsey, penciled by Chris Ecker, inked by Mike Schneider, now comics $1.50. My excitement over the Gladstones has encouraged me to explore other funny animal comics on the market, most of them small circulation black and whites, in hope of finding some more magic. I had tried Fantagraphics books, Critters, off and on over the last few months, ultimately giving up on it, despite a few good moments. But I hadn't even looked at Eben until issue number 4. Eben has an awful lot going for it. Chris Ecker is a very promising penciler, a glib visual storyteller with a superb touch for facial expression and characterization. He uses an appealing, quasi-realistic drawing style that gives his human-bodied animals, or animal-headed humans, real believability. But he doesn't neglect the power of cartooning to bring out humor and emotion. Mike Schneider's inking is rich and detailed, making fine use of black and white medium without the use of washes or grays. Carefully observed, intricate backgrounds, whether the work of penciler or inker, I don't know, put me in mind of fine, old-fashioned children's books. The premise, a sword-wielding raven, a worrisome old rabbit and a naive young tiger wander through a rustic post-Holocaust world populated by anthropomorphic animals is an intriguing one and promises a wealth of material for self-contained single-issue stories. The dialogue is fine too, fleshing out the characters charmingly and occasionally supplying some humor by itself. The problems are with the plot and the gags. This issue is a vamp of the old mad scientist routine, a sort of zoomorphic Rocky horror show with all the predictable jokes and situations that that plot brings to mind. And when Dempsey departs from that stereotyped plot to play a few humor riffs of his own. His choices are unimaginative and inappropriate. At one point, the brutish monster infant, named Junior of course, who is kept captive by the mad scientist, 
calls out for pizza. And when the pizza man arrives, he turns out to be a rodent version of Gomer Pyle. Here we have two of the deadest, stupidest, but most common of fantasy cliche jokes rolled into one. Why do lame pizza jokes hang on so tenaciously in the products of young pop culture junkies? Does anyone still think it's funny to have big dumb brutes yelling pizza as they reach out and crush the carton? For God's sake, how many times does a joke have to be done before people realize it was never funny in the first place? And why Gomer Pyle? Ripping off someone else's humor does not make your own work funny. Especially when your ripoff contains none of the bite or satire or cleverness of the parody. And when the other guy's humor is over 20 years old anyway. We thought it was pretty funny to go around talking like Gomer Pyle in the fourth grade. But within a couple of years, we were looking back on that with embarrassment. And there is no wit, no subtlety in Dempsey's handling of the joke. We aren't made to guess that this is Gomer Pyle. The pizza man's shirt has Pyle stitched right on the pocket. He says, golly, and shazam, and talks about Chef Carter, all within four panels. Why do so many young comic book people people do this crap? Why turn a charming humor adventure story into just another piece of half-witted TV addict self-indulgence? The backup story, Combat Wombat and His Howlin' Critters, written by Dempsey with art attributed to Grass Green, is sort of the flip side of Eben. It starts off looking like a fanish parody of Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, but turns out to be a more generalized farce on war movies, war comics, and even a few realities of war. Unfortunately, the gags feel forced and the art looks badly undeveloped. Green, like so many humor cartoonists in the independent scene, seems to be inspired more by serious superhero artists than by the great funny men. Evan is probably the best non-Disney funny animal comic out there right now and it has the makings of something very good but Dempsey needs to grow up quite a bit as a writer and a humorist before it can break free of its adolescent limitations. After a line-wide skip month, October 1986 brought a new series of Ralph Snart adventures, plus a continuation of Prime Slime Tales, over from Mirage Publishing. The third issues of Siphons and Vector joined Eben No. 5, featuring a Matt Wagner cover. Ralph Snart Adventures Vol. 2 No. 2 was it for November, and was back again in December. Excerpt from the December 15th, 1986 Amazing Heroes No. 108. Now Siphons, option for movie series. Now comics publisher Tony Caputo has announced that Now's full-color adventure series, Siphons, has been optioned for a proposed series of feature films. Now was approached by two independent producers to work on a movie deal that may eventually involve 20th Century Fox. Should the movie come to pass, Siphons creator Alan Curtis will act as creative consultant. The exact same press release is revisited, seemingly verbatim, in the February 15th, 1987 cover dated Amazing Heroes number 111. So I guess Tony Caputo really wanted you to know that somebody in Hollywood somewhere wanted to make a Siphons movie. Now had its most ambitious slate yet, with Siphons and Vector numbers 4, Silverwing special number 1, the late Megaton artist Gary Thomas Washington's holiday special A Boy and His Abot, the first and ultimately only issue of Valor Thunderstar and His Fireflies, featuring a Jerry Ordway cover, one last issue of Prime Slime Tales, and Eben number 6. Excerpt from the March 15th, 1987 cover dated Amazing Heroes number 113, Newsline. Scheduling changes at now. Eben will be going monthly this spring, as a new artistic team of Paul Mounts and Mike Schrader take over with number 6. Former artist Chris Ecker is busy on Combat Wombat and his Howlin' Critters. Issue number 7, out in May, will be the first monthly issue, and there are plans to make the 10th issue a full-color one. Now is delaying Valor Thunderstar and his Fireflies from December to March release, partly as a result of shifts in the creative team, partly to avoid the glut of comics that afflicted the market toward the beginning of the year. To reiterate the team, creator Jonathan Carr is writing, John Thompson and Brian Thomas are drawing the first issue, and Tony Atkins and Paul Mounts are drawing the second issue. The first issue boasts a cover penciled by Jerry Ordway. Bill Reinhold handles the second issues. Now has canceled Prime Slime Tales with number four, which shipped in early February. Tony Basilicato has been too busy with other projects to keep the book on schedule, and it was asked by mutual consent between creator and publisher. Now had announced in-house and in trade publications like Amazing Heroes plans to turn Eben monthly. There was a new series artist in future star colorist Paul Mounts, trending toward a darker, more serious, and character-oriented take. This was undone by a comedic cover by Jim Engel featuring Dick Duck, Duck Dick, who starred in a nine-page solo lead story. You'll recall that I mentioned the black and white comics boom around 1985, which busted toward the end of 1986. Eben was among its victims, joined by Vector. I also mentioned the first distributor wars. Glenwood Distribution, for instance, had used a hybrid program where they would airmail to one of several regional distribution centers and truck it from there. According to an article by Tony C. Caputo for the 
website independent publisher, by 1987, Glenwood Distributors was the largest of eight direct market distributors. However, it too was a victim of the black and white bust. Caputo's Now Comics was in its first year of publishing, and Glenwood represented 50 to 60 percent of Now's total orders. Caputo managed to survive thanks to a secured loan, but Glenwood apparently took a lot of additional small press publishers down with them. Originally, the Terminator was going to actually be a dual threat. There were going to be two Terminators that came from the future, just like there were supposed to be two humans that come back from the future to stop the robots, but one have died in transit. The original idea was that these Terminators would be nondescript, that anybody could pop out and be a Terminator, likely recalling the various assassins that had gained notoriety in the latter half of the 20th century. Cameron had a good working relationship with Lance Hendrickson, who played a sheriff in Piranha 2. That was his initial pick to play the main Terminator. And again, being a talented artist, he actually drew Hendrickson as the Terminator as a split image, one half robot, one half Hendrickson holding a gun. Supposedly, part of what won Hemdale over was that Hendrickson had come to their offices in costume, had a seat, stared straight ahead, creeped everybody out. They were apparently on the verge of calling police when Cameron and Heard showed up, greeted Hendrickson, and they all went in for the meeting. However, for this movie to happen, they were going to need star power. They scored a meeting with one of the hottest talents rising in the industry at that time, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Cameron had no faith in Schwarzenegger, especially because the intention was him to play the hero role of Kyle Reese. And so even though it meant that it would possibly scuttle his chance of directing the movie at all, he went to that meeting with the intention of sabotaging it. He wanted to anger Schwarzenegger and make him not want to be in the movie and then hopefully get to cast an actor that he's more happier with. The plan hit a snag when Cameron and Schwarzenegger got on famously at the dinner. They liked each other. They shared a vision. Now, depending on who you believe... Cameron thought he was going to have to talk Schwarzenegger out of being the hero and into being the Terminator. After the meeting, Cameron even did a redo of his painting of the Terminator, this time featuring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger himself says that on reading the script, he always saw himself as the Terminator, but neither one of them wanted to broach the subject at the meeting since they knew that he was meeting to discuss the hero role. Both parties agree, though, that they had to call up his agent and talk the agent into allowing him to play a part that only had something like 16 lines and that the agent felt would destroy his career because it would show him as being limited but eventually the agent relented the presence of Arnold Schwarzenegger helped to secure a reasonable budget poor Lance Hendrickson was demoted to being a police officer in the film I'm not sure why he didn't go for the Kyle Reese role probably they were looking for a little bit more of a conventional romantic lead Michael Biehn apparently knocked it out of the park when he auditioned for the role of Kyle Reese, with the exception that he had been rehearsing for a Tennessee Williams play and unfortunately brought a Southern draw with him to the audition that he didn't recognize while performing. Cameron's people called Biehn's people, explained that they liked his performance but didn't like the accent. They explained what accent and eventually Biehn was able to audition again in his normal voice. Problem though is that Schwarzenegger was already committed to filming the sequel to his hit movie, Conan, Conan the Destroyer, and that movie's producer, Dino De Laurentiis, forced the production to wait a year because he didn't want anything competing with or interfering with the distribution and promotion of Conan the Destroyer. There was also an argument made that he thought that the Terminator was going to sink Schwarzenegger's appeal and harm the box office of his Conan movie. Obviously, this was a major setback for Cameron and company. They did take that year to do some more planning, change the location, filming location. Earlier on, Linda Hamilton had been cast in the role of Sarah Connor. Because of the year delay, her role became more tentative. She was eventually recast because she had, depending on sources, either sprained or fractured or even shattered one of her ankles. Other actresses had been up for the role. The one that impacted me the most was Leah Thompson, who I adore, but she could have never made the transition from the Sarah Connor of Terminator to T2. I don't know of pretty much any other actress offhand that could have. Even Ripley herself, Sigourney Weaver, I could never buy her as a waitress, punching bag, couldn't have pulled that off. Hamilton was a rare actress that could play both of those roles so effectively. But again, she'd broken her ankle. She wasn't going to be available as a result of that. They had actually brought in another actress for the role who dropped out to do another movie. The result was that they had to have Hamilton film all of her non-running scenes and the front half of the production and they just do the best they can with her running around at the end. Her legs strapped up as tight as they could. And uh, according to her, while she was being interviewed for T2, she never fully recovered from that ankle injury. The Terminator was a somewhat troubled production. They were trying to push what dollars they had as far as they possibly could and ultimately further. Depending on some sources, 
the night shoots were done because it was going to help with special effects, with production costs. I believe Cameron himself has said that no, in fact, they begged him to shoot more of the film during the day. It was going to be cheaper for them, but the movie needed that night feel, and I tend to agree. Part of what I love about the movie is it's such a gritty, grindhouse kind of flick, while also being a sci-fi action suspense a little bit of everything. It would lose a lot of its impact if it didn't spend so much time in the night with all that neon. Linda Hamilton and Cameron specifically did not get on well during the production. At one point, she was forced to confront him, explain to him that he was dealing with actors, not props, and he needed to start treating everybody like a human being or she was gonna walk off the set. Schwarzenegger suffered quite a bit for his art. At one point, he was asked to punch out a car window, not candy glass, literally a regular car window, in order to get the smoking effects on his body after he'd been burned. They poured actual acid onto him. He did not shave his eyebrows for the role that was done with special effects, but the reason why the special effects was deployed was because Schwarzenegger was afraid that all the fire was going to burn off his actual eyebrows and that they wouldn't grow back. In the end, they had run out of money and many shots from the movie were stolen. They were not properly licensed from the city and they got these things knocked out as quickly as they could. Among those shots was the before and after of the death of the first Sarah Connor. Again, the scene where he has the punch out, the station wagon window, and also the final shot of Linda Hamilton's character driving off on a Mexican highway. In fact, cops stopped them during the filming. Cameron had to talk his way out of it by pretending that they were doing a student film. Expectations were low on The Terminator. Again, it was thought of to be a B movie. Schwarzenegger himself wasn't sure that he had made a mistake, but Cameron put together a work print for him to watch. And he was amazed. He clearly saw the potential of the movie and was 100% behind it. It ultimately performed very well at the box office. It made $78.3 million, 13 times the production budget. And it had a long and healthy life on home video, cable, television. But it was still regarded somewhat as a sleeper. It's a movie that just kept building and building in popularity and financial success over the years. That's part of why it took nearly a decade to finally get around to doing a sequel. Everybody came away from this much improved. Jim Cameron went on to the movie Aliens, along with Michael Biehn eventually. He had to replace an actor who got busted on drug charges, but he quit himself very well and certainly didn't hurt his career going from Terminator 2 Aliens. Then Hamilton, of course, became co-lead on the hit CBS series Beauty and the Beast, and Schwarzenegger went on to roles such as Predator, Total Recall, The Running Man, before two of the three returned for the sequel Terminator 2 Judgment Day. The first third of the new year was defined by monthly Ralph Snart adventures, joined by only a single issue of Siphons. Excerpt from the summer 1986, cover dated Amazing Heroes preview special number three. Ralph Snart adventures, written and illustrated by Mark Hansen. 32 black and white pages on newsprint, $1. Direct sales distribution, published by Now Comics. Once there was an accountant named Ralph Snart, and once he had a bad day, a very bad day. So bad, in fact, that he went insane and was put into an Izod straitjacket and thrown into a big room with rubber walls. But though Ralph's body is, er, tied up in the asylum, his mind is not. In fact, Ralph's mind goes into the future, into the past, and anywhere else that he winds up. The unorthodox hero, for example, finds himself back in the 50s, being the assistant to an artist in a comics company that sort of resembles EC. He faces harrowing adventures, harrowing heroines, and harrowing doctors in the real world who are trying to fix his little psyche. Mark Nelson's humor, wit, and imagination just had to be put into comics form, added Caputo. He is what is known as a comics genius. The stories he is doing are totally hysterical. The backup feature for Ralph Snart Adventures is entitled Little Ralphie, stories of our hero Snart when he was a little boy. Excerpt from May 1st, 1987, Amazing Heroes number 116, Newsline. Now, Snart goes to color, die kamikaze. Ralph Snart, Mark Hansen's humorous anti-hero, goes to full color with the June issue of his comic Ralph Snart Adventures number eight. The price of the comic will be kept at $1.50 despite the change. Also watch for a full color Ralph Snart poster in May. Also coming up from now in May is the full-color Dai Kamikaze, described as the future of Japanese science fiction, written by Brian Augustin and Lynn Straczewski, and penciled by Cliff Van Meter. This series is said to be about people, their sins, their desires, their dreams, and their last-ditch effort to save themselves. And oh yeah, it's about the last giant robot in the universe. Excerpt from the summer 1987 cover dated Amazing Heroes preview special number 5. Dai Kamikaze, written by Lynn Straczewski and Brian Augustin, penciled by Cliff Van Meter, edited by Brian Augustin. Two full color pages, dollar fifty monthly from Now Comics. Curious about the exploits of the last giant robot in the universe? You come out to the right title, Die 
Kamikaze, which debuts in May, is a very warlike book, says now publisher Tony Caputo. It's like World War II, not Korea or Vietnam, though. The war, which takes place in the distant future, pits Earth against a race of aggressive colonists who have yet to meet a planet they didn't want. Unexpected allies of Earth are from the Chirek, an insect race who are normally quite passive. The Chirek, however, believe that if the Earth capitulates to the colonizers, their planet will fall next. So they donate a giant robot, which has just been sitting around on their planet to the Earth's cause. Five Earthlings are assigned to operate the robot. One of the soldiers dubs the robot Dai Kamikaze, which Caputo claims is great warrior in Japanese. No one gets the joke, says Caputo. They just get nervous because they hear Kamikaze. They think it means a suicide mission, which, when it's an assignment that pits five guys and a giant robot against an army, is more than likely. Nevertheless, Dai Kamikaze comes through, and Earth experiences a victory of sorts. I think that's enough of spoiling the plot for you now. Go read it yourself, and no fair peeking at the ending. May saw the launch of the early Ameri manga series Dai Kamikaze, by future DC talents Len Straczynski and Brian Augustin with artist Gideon. By number 5, the entire creative team was gone, replaced by Kirk Critton and Rob Davis, who shepherded the rest of the dozen issue run into July of 1988. Excerpt from the July 1st, 1987, Amazing Heroes number 120. Newsline. Summer 87, a comics club of a different color. Distributors have begun issuing warnings to their retail accounts that after last year's black and white glut, the summer of 1987 may see an even worse glut of color comics. As Capital City Distribution's newsletter, Internal Correspondence, puts it, many retailers seem to have decided that they'll do better by publishing bad color books than they did publishing bad black and white books. Additionally, despite the near collapse of the black and white market, the number of black and whites has actually continued to increase. As a result, on Capital City's May list, there were 355 titles, and it would have cost a fan $697.29, or $25 a day, to buy one of each. At last count, close to a dozen publishers, new and old, were throwing their hats into the ring with color lines. ARG, Antarctic New Age, Blackthorn Timeline, Dark Horse, Eternity, Hero, Megaton, Metro, Silverwolf, Salson, and Vanguard all announced their first color comics during the spring, while NOW has converted all its titles to color and hopes to have 10 full color monthlies by the end of the year. What this means for readers, most likely, aside from a bewildering array of titles and companies to choose from, is an increasing frequency of late and canceled titles as the many publishers battle for room in a still limited market, as well as possibly a backlash against all alternative publishers, anyone but the big five, on both the customer and retailer level. Excerpt from the June 1st, 1987, Amazing Heroes number 118. Japan Animation at Now. Astro Boy, Speed Racer, Comics on Schedule. Now Comics has acquired the rights to Astro Boy and Speed Racer, the famous Japanese cartoon and comic book characters. Speed Racer will be written by Lin Dai Kamikaze Straczynski and penciled by Gary Thomas, a boy in his bot, Washington. No inker has been chosen for the project, and now it's searching for a colorist who can duplicate the slick, airbrush look of the original cartoons. Michael Dempsey, the creator of Now's Eben, will be writing the Astro Boy series. With plotting assists from Japanese cartoon expert Fred Patton, Ken Stacy will be penciling and coloring the series with Rodney Dunn inking. Cover artists scheduled for early issues include Mark Wheatley, Brian Thomas, and Chuck Fiala, all fans of the TV series, although Stacy himself will execute the covers to issues number one and two. Publisher Tony Caputo promises that both series will be faithful to the original, though the series will be updated to the current times. Speed Racer will premiere in June and Astro Boy July, both as full color $1.50 comics. There will also be an Astro Boy fan club and a Speed Racer fan club, 
with attendant t-shirts, posters, buttons, and so forth. Rust Never Sleeps. Another monthly full-color series from now is Rust, a superhero series written by Steve Miller, John Stadema, who has worked as an assistant for Jerry Ordway, will pencil the series, and Paul Mouth will be inking and coloring it. The first issue ships in June, and like Astro Boy, it's $1.50 a shot. Now has put its graphic novel line on the shelf for the time being, preferring instead to focus on its growing, 7 as of July, full-color comics line. There will be at least two more added by Christmas 87, so now should go into 1988 with a line of close to 10 full-color monthly titles. Among Now's greatest success stories though was its first licensed title, the popular 1960s Japanese animation import Speed Racer. Featuring nifty painted covers by Ken Stesi on the first four issues, Stesi also painted the cover to July 1987's original Astro Boy No. 1, but did Speed Racer 1 better by also providing writing and interior art on most of the 20-issue run. I suspect it was Stesi's longest run in comics. Excerpt from the summer 1987 cover dated Amazing Heroes Preview Special No. 5. Astro Boy, written by Michael Dempsey, penciled and colored by Ken Stacy, inked by Rodney Dunn, story edited by Fred Patton, creative edited by Robin Layden. 32 full color pages, $1.50, newsstand distribution, monthly from Now Comics. This is the biggie, says Now publisher Tony Caputo, contrasting his new Astro Boy series to the rest of the line of his books. The title is based on the black and white series from the 60s, which Caputo claims was the first Japanese animation. It's the one that started it all. The comic book series, which debuts in July, will, at the request of the series' owners, Suzuki Associates International, stick pretty close to the animated Astro Boy, detailing what happened in the first several episodes. These chronicle the attempts by Dr. Boynton, aggrieved by his son's death, to replace the boy with a robot, Astro Boy. Complications occur when Astro Boy turns out to be less than perfect, and Boynton becomes slightly unhinged. We're not improving it really, says Caputo. We're modernizing it. He cites Astro Boy's appearance in particular. Astro Boy was unique in the 60s, but now we have robots up the wazoo. To make Astro Boy unique again, we're going to make him a high-tech robot. Speed Racer, written by Lynn Straczewski, penciled by Gary Thomas Washington, inked by Brian Thomas, edited by Brian Augustine. 32 full-color pages, $1.50, newsstand distribution, monthly from now comics go speed racer go speed racer go speed racer go yep i remember the cartoons theme tune and i bet you do too now publisher tony caputo claims that speed racer is the most popular japanese animation in the u.s due to the numerous tv airings of the cartoon on a daily basis in the contracts for speed racer cartoons it did not state that tv stations after one year had to destroy the tapes as is standard in contracts of this sort so speed racer has been played for over 10 years although based on the animated adventures of the teen car racer the comic book series will feature all new stories, beginning with issue number one in June, detailing Speed Racer's origin. The title was licensed from Coca-Cola, via Columbia Pictures, CST Entertainment, and Alien Enterprises, testifying to the determination of the comic's publisher. By the end of 1987, none of Now's launch titles were still in print, and the monthly regulars were Dai Kamikaze, Original Astro Boy, Rust, and Speed Racer. This would continue until May 1988, when Speed's brother Racer X got his own title for 11 issues. It was launched by Fred Schiller and George Booker, but they were almost immediately replaced by Steven Sullivan and Vince Argandetzi. Given the success of their licensed titles derived from Japanese animation, now found another successful pivot point with established IP closer to home. June of 1988 offered two debuts to replace the fallen Dai Kamikaze and Rust. The real Ghostbusters No. 1 had another increasingly trademark Ken Stesi cover, with interiors by James Van Heys and John Tobias, whose brief careers were largely devoted to the property. The other license was from Hemdale Film Corporation, who held the rights to Jim Cameron Cameron's The Terminator. I knew I recognized Fred Schiller's name, even though his writing credits only ran one page on the Grand Comics database. He got his start on Spectrum Comics The Guardian, a very short-lived color nighttime vigilante hero series from 1984 that I pulled out of a dollar bin a few years ago. That title at least got two issues, where his second teaming with Tom Morgan on codename Strike Force only managed one. A couple years later, he co-plotted an Amazing Spider-Man annual featuring Iron Man 2020. His longest run in comics was at Now, where he took over writing the first series of Rust from number 3 until the penultimate 12th issue. He also did the first couple of Racer X solo stories before leaving for Eclipse Comics and New Comics Group, a line that mostly lived and died in 1989. Schiller was also the main author behind the similarly doomed Majestic Entertainment titles of 1993, representing three series that combined yielded five published comic books. Schiller's highest profile gig was Professor Xavier and the X-Men, part of Marvel's attempt to lure back budget-conscious readers with a 99-cent line of retro titles. The cult favorite Untold Tales of Spider-Man came out of this effort, but the original X-Men also had a book in this race, 
and Schiller wrote about half of its 18-issue run. Probably his career highlight was a story in the Miracleman Apocrypha Anthology. The art was by Tony Akins, who drew most of the same issues of Rust that Schiller wrote before the creative team moved to Terminator, without missing a month. After Terminator, which will be very soon indeed, Akins would draw a couple issues of Nexus, and a bit more work for First Comics, before moving on to odds and sods on Comico's elementals, including the sex specials. Next he would draw the opening arc of Aliens, Colonial Marines in 1993. Copy from the inside front cover, now on sale, The Terminator 1, by Fred Schiller, Tony Akins, and Jim Brosman. He's back, 500 pounds of unstoppable terror, The Terminator, but now it's the year 2031, and the battle between humanity and the Terminators continues, non-stop action and suspense. Full color Baxter Monthly, $1.75 US, $2.25 Canada. The inside front cover also features an editorial from Tony Caputo, the publisher, the Now Comics annual update. I've decided to start an annual update every summer on the inside front cover of our books. This will keep all our readers ahead of the game and information. Let's see. This summer we have an incredible lineup of books. The Real Ghostbusters, The Terminator, which is set in the post-nuclear war future where mankind is fighting for survival against the technology it originally created. Rust, Speed Racer, with the fantastic new art of Joe Phillips. Racer X, the original Astro Boy. Fright Night, which follows the regular monthly adventures of Peter Vincent and Charlie Brewster, the vampire killers of the 90s. And for the people who enjoy side-splitting, knee-slapping, eye-popping, and nose-blowing humor, should try the monthly adventures of a CPA gone mad, Ralph Snart Adventures, called the funniest comic book by millions. Okay, okay, thousands. A must for anyone who's laughed within the past five hours. A few of our other surprises for this year include the Speed Racer Classics Volume 1 and 2. This 225 page paperback translates the original Speed Racer comics by Speed's Japanese creator Tatsuo Yoshida. Volume 1 will be on sale in late August and sell for only $3.75, also including a fantastic wraparound cover by Mitch O'Connell. Volume 2 will ship for Christmas sales with an extra added bonus. For those of you who can't wait until August, the Speed Racer Special Edition Number 1 will be available in late July with two unique Speed Racer stories and 10 pages of super high tech airbrush illustrations of how the fabulous Mach 5 works. All this in a giant pinup too. Stick around. We've some more surprises up our sleeves. For any more information, just write us. Or better yet, write us a letter with your comments. The address is now Comics, 332 South Michigan Avenue, Suite 1540, Chicago, Illinois, 60604. And remember, Comics, the future is now. Every issue of Now's Terminator series begins with the cover blurb, it's 2031, and the battle continues. Everyone who saw the Terminator in 1984 wanted a sequel set during the war with the machines. Yet virtually every Every movie sequel and most comics take place more or less in the time period in which they were filmed. Now's Terminator is the only series that committed to tales set in the future, and they did such a poor job of it that there's little wonder why everyone since has veered away. The story begins in a ruined city five miles north of Miami on December 22nd, 2031. I know what you're thinking. The city of North Miami is north of Miami, so why not just say North Miami? Actually, Miami is sort of shaped like half a starfish, so maybe they meant Hialeah. I don't know if you need to get that specific in the machine apocalypse, but I also don't think we need to specify the setting as five miles north of Miami. Why not just say near Miami, or even just set it in Miami? Oh, were you thinking the other thing? That setting the story so close to Christmas means a holiday story is weirdly imminent, or that they're going to have to change the cover blurb very soon? I just told you, the entire 17-issue series has the same blurb, and therefore takes place during the last 10 days of that year, and Santa Claus was executed by Skynet. John Connor is your savior now, so shut your yap. You'll wish you had a lump of coal to burn for warmth, what with Miami's freezing mid-70s winters. Where were we? Oh yeah. So a homeless woman dressed like Mad Hetty in a Miami winter, who does not appear to be within her childbearing years, runs through the streets carrying a silent swaddled baby while pursued by T-800 endoskeletons. She is saved by Sarah Slammers, a famed local militia uncommonly effective at terminating Terminators. The seeming leader at first is Doyle, who looks and acts very much like the evolution of Sarah Connor in the still unmade Judgment Day sequel. She figures out that it is all a ruse, and that both woman and infant are actually Terminators themselves. She blasts them with 2031 firepower, and refers to them as Gators, a confusing nickname that will nonetheless be the dominant term for Terminators over the course of this series. Also, 
The series will mostly be set in Florida and involve actual alligators and crocodiles at times. While the mother is destroyed, the injured infant hisses and escapes to report back to Skynet. Meanwhile, a second group of scientists in a high-tech flying machine are trying to collect plankton for study. Their ship is struck when too near to the firefight between Sarah Slammers and Terminator reinforcements led by the baby. Both sides mistake the ship as belonging to the enemy, and it is forced to crash land. There's another guy in the Slammers whose leadership abilities are questioned after heavy casualties. His name is Leahy, and it'll be another issue or two before I realize that he's the actual boss of the team. The Slammers and the scientists team up to dismantle the Terminators, and then one has to prove to the other that they're human. See, the scientists are from a lunar base established in 1998 by the United Nations, dubbed Lil Houston, who opted to stay secret and sit out the war. There were initially 17 scientists and mission specialists, who in the 33 years since completed the base and had children. Despite some argument within the camp, it was ultimately decided to only interact with Earth to gather materials unavailable on the moon base. Only now, decades later, and not having faced the radiation or deprivation of the humans on Earth, do these scientists have to opt in on engaging Skynet? Cut to Bedford Falls, a fictional town that references the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Again, there will be no very special Christmas episode, and yet there that is. The town is run by Terminators to serve a population of sympathetic, brainwashed humans under Skynet control. One of Sarah Slammer's spies, Martin Reedfoot, gets captured before he can fully relay this information. Jump to home base, the rebel's stronghold, housed in a missile silo. Don't get comfortable or bother committing much of this to memory. We start to get some introductions. Essie Dorian is a freckled lady tech with the Slammers. Slager is a bearded African-American man. The Asian man named Gao is one of the most visible of the scientists. Casey Burwanger is a long brown-haired lady scientist who tries to befriend Doyle. Conrad is a long-haired man who is super polite, very strong, is liked by dogs, and always wears a visor. He's the one who gets mowed down by gunfire and revealed to be what appears to be a new form of Terminator. End issue 1. Not great, but not completely terrible, aside from the awful name of the militia. A fair amount of potential. So of course both the writer and artist left the book after the debut issue, leaving only bottom-of-the-line talent like Inker Jim Brosman. He would stick with the Terminator until number 9, and various other now series until the company's closure in 1994. His last comics work was throughout the run of Gary Carlson's Big Bang Comics, the golden-slash-silver age retro superhero anthology published by Image for 35 issues. The Terminator 2, the conclusion of the first issue story. The Rebels discover that there is a way to stop a Terminator. No further credits or details. The new penciler was Thomas A. Tenney, later to be best known as simply Tom Tenney. Aside from pinups and covers, he'd previously only drawn a few Robotech comics comics for Comico. Tenney would go on to draw most of the Terminator run, through number 16. After that, he was back doing Robotech, this time for Eternity Comics. Then he disappeared for a year and a half, resurfacing with a bold new style to transition Marvel's Avengers West Coast into the very Chromium 90s Force Work series. Tenney produced four exceedingly distinctive issues of the squish-faced heroes of Force Works, before being lured away to draw part of a Chapel miniseries, and then exited the comic book industry more or less for good. As for the writer of the Terminator, issue numbers 2 through 3, publisher Tony Caputo, turning in his first ever scripts. Let's just say that he was no Mike Richardson, and I'd guess this wasn't the first time that phrase was uttered. Apparently, in our near future, surely spinning out of a TikTok trend, the human soldiers will all start talking like they're in old World War II movies, complete with regional phonetic dialects. Member troops, don't stop till you drop. Sergeant Fury and his howl, or Johnny O and the synth slashers bemoaned pitting their conventional weapons against Terminators with plasma rifles, as they nonetheless laid siege to a base. Their flesh and bone bodies failed to hold up as well as imitation meat and metal, but the troop was lucky enough to reach an advanced weapons cache to plunder. I doubt these models will be referenced again, so I'll just briefly acknowledge their odd a plasma 404 and a 506 PHW. The synth slashers were not above deploying child soldiers, and when a blonde-haired boy realized smoke was interfering with the T-800 sensors, causing them to shoot at one another. He joined in with a plasma rifle. The recoil was too much for the lad, 
so he accidentally hit a case of grenades, and that was that for Johnny O and the Sin Slashers. So much for Tony Caputo's naked bid to woo John Ostrander to work for him. Another area where Mike Richardson would have more success. The only survivors were the little boy and his fellow Aryan child soldier, this one a female named Anne. The kids had learned well from helping Johnny O take down Terminator factories in Atlanta, and knock down AT-800 to make a run for it. They ended up in what appeared to be a Cyberdyne Systems Series A vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Somehow managing to get it airborne despite there being no writing on the controls, and acknowledging that they are usually navigated by remote. In fact, Skynet immediately reclaims the vessel, but a hole was punched in it by a pursuing T-800 that was large enough for the kids to crawl through. They jump for it and land in a swamp, knocking Anne out. The still unidentified boy carries her to a nearby but unfamiliar base. Inside the Sarah Slammer's home base, there was a heated argument over terminating Conrad with a K, who was revealed to be a synthetic. Whether it's a bigger lift from Blade Runner or Alien is up to you, but Conrad is a superpowered servant who only wants to help the humans. Supposedly, Conrad is one of a kind, and a far superior technology to the Terminators. I guess they just didn't have the resources on the moon to make more? Anyway, the argument is rendered moot by Conrad's ability to repeatedly snatch the guns out of the hands of people waving them in his direction. The scientists need access to a computer, and the only one nearby is at the flesh farm Reedfoot was surveilling. The two groups were discussing the feasibility of penetrating the flesh farm, as well as a recent rumor about the development of time travel involving the 132nd under Perry attempting to send a soldier named Kyle Reese back, when home base was assailed. Expecting the Gators, though Caputo started throwing naders around to dilute the stupidity of that nickname, the soldiers found instead that the boy had blown a hole in their perimeter with a grenade. Grenade? The heck? I meant grenade. There was a brief standoff when the child assumed they were Terminators because they were all too old and slow to be human survivors, but is quickly won over by the legends that are, sigh, Sarah's slammers. The way the boy kept referencing Johnny O, he was asked if that was his older brother. No, his brother had disappeared on a mission a while ago, and he had known John Connor. Yeah, sure kid. What's your name anyway? Reese. Tim Reese. For all the trash I talked about Caputo debuting as a writer on Terminator No. 2, it wasn't a bad read. Tom Tenney's art isn't exactly ready for prime time, but it has some golden-esque moments, especially in the early pages that may have been swiping that nom for all I know. I'll just cast aspersions in a backhanded comment and not check. As for the colorist, there's no credit taken, and I can see why. Now on sale, Terminator 3, by Tony Caputo, Thomas Tinney, Jim Brosman, and Rich Powers. The savage assault on the Sarah Slammer's home base, which ends in death, destructions, and a startling revelation. Monthly, two exclamation points. And this is the first time when the name Terminator doesn't end in an exclamation point. The first story with a title. If I had a borrowed as it may be, begins with Skynet's assault on the Sarah Slammer's base. In a nod or an insult to the initial writer, a soldier named Schiller got blown up in the distance. Then Commander Rossetti shares her idea with Commander Leahy to use the synthetic Conrad, as well as Lotney's computer, to override the commands on one of Skynet's aircraft to gain information on the flesh farm. Leahy further considered the sad shape of their ground transportation, and what an advantage that aircraft could provide just to exit the compound. Meanwhile, in a bomb shelter, Tim Reese learned that his brother's unit had all perished in a massive explosion. Speaking of such, Commander Leahy blew up the home base after all of his surviving crew had boarded the successfully commandeered aircraft. Conrad and his dumb casino visor had secured the ship, while Lotney's hacker skills gleaned the destination. They head to one of the same hunter-killer factories where Johnny O.S. Troop had bought it, and don't fare much better. One of the comic-specific conceits is that Skynet is infatuated with the idea of domesticating humans under their own terms. For instance, they discover Reedfoot has become a Stepford wife at the Flesh Farm, and after a love tap, discover that his lobotomized brain was now housed in a cybernetic body that only resembled the original. The specific panel also recalls the shot where Captain Taylor discovered one of his fellow astronauts had been vivisected, for extra discredit derivation. Reedfoot breaks the neck of a soldier identified as Shilly, so I really have to wonder about the terms of Fred Schiller's exit that he was murdered by proxy twice in one issue. Reedfoot is destroyed, but a bunch of other people get killed by T-800s and the tank Terminators that had previously killed Johnny O, properly identified as the enforcers here. Among the casualties were computer expert Lotney, the other black guy named Slage, and poor little girl Anne. Doyle took a grazing shot to the cheek, 
destroying her cool Sarah Connor sunglasses that Sarah Connor hasn't worn yet. Well, technically, it's the year 2031 in this series, so the real Sarah wore them 40 years earlier, but Linda Hamilton hasn't put them on in a movie yet. Oh, and a Terminator wears a chef's hat during the massacre, which is a chef's kiss of a panel. The Slammers manage to score some weapons and a van to escape in, but the handful of survivors are left severely demoralized. In fact, during the epilogue, Rossetti from the lunar base takes her own life, rather than suffer the stress of waiting a year for a recovery vessel. So I guess this is a holiday story after all? Anyway, the show is over an hour now, and we'll have actual human guests starting with the next episode, so let's wrap this up. We haven't decided if this will be episode number 0 or number 1, or whether it will run after Christmas or New Year's, but we probably won't have time either way to hire an Arnold impersonator for disclaimers. I'll just say that this was a not-for-profit fan podcast by Rolled Spine, and that no copyright infringement was intended. Not that it matters, since if anyone bothers to listen, their lawyers can crush us like Skynet, regardless of the merits of the case.